welcome to the 2020 Brain and Transcranial Photobiomodulation Virtual Summit. I'm Dr. Joe DeDure, your host, and my, gift, my guest today is uh, Professor Dr. Ann Liebert. She's Director of Photomolecular Research at the Austra Australis Australasian Research Institute, the North Shore Musculoskeletal and Laser Physiotherapy uh, Office there. She's currently an adjunct senior lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. She's also the Honorary Director of the Photomolecular Research at the Australasian Research Institute. As an accredited health professional at the Sydney Adventist Hospital. And uh, she's also the Vice President of the Australian Medical Laser Association and is on the board of WALL. As you'll see, her research interests are in photobiomodulation therapy and neuroprotection and cardioprotection. She has a grant from the Parkinson South Australia for research and she's doing experimental collaborations and molecular mechanisms of photobiomodulation. Anne's been working with photobiomodulation therapy since 1988 with such great results when she collaborated with uh, Roberta Chow in 2008 at Sydney University to understand how laser works for pain. She wanted to study the mechanisms and in, in her six years she looked at chronic headache and neck pain as well as other diseases like uh, central pain, Parkinson's disease, and bad diseases that were really intractable. In 2012, uh, Anne gave the uh, World Association of Laser Therapists keynote speech. Keynote speech. And uh, she kind of put a hypothesis out there as to how photobiomodulation works. And, and this was received with the consensus that it was too controversial, it was not helpful, and she should not repeat it again. What she did was went on and spent the next year writing her PhD uh, hypothesis. And in 2013, it was published and it subsequently won the Global Medical Discovery Award from Canada, Canada as having a significant uh, medical discovery. She was invited to one of the most prestigious protein uh, conferences in prote proteomics, where the first eight speakers were all Nobel laureate winners. So we are quite honored to have uh, uh, Anne with us. Anne, thank you for your participation. Thank you. I want to show this, if I may, that she's also um, part of this great online conference that's still available until April 30th. I want people to pay attention to this because it's an amazing conference. You should go, there's a link in the bio there, a link in the thing, where there's just so much information on Parkinson's disease and its therapeutics. Uh, I, I think that this is going to be a monumental event it's covering all areas of diet and exercise. It's actually a, like a complete rehabilitative program here. A great system. Please take a look at it. I think it's a, well, very well put out and days and days and days of information. So wonderful, Anne. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for this. And this is where she's coming from. Some place. Uh, down under, you know, I, fi I finally started putting the map on here because I really didn't know where most of these places were. So I'm going to stop my share. And, and uh, you gave us a good run through. But uh, what are you going to uh, tell us about? What, what, you explain a little bit about your story and your expertise. Can you give us a top off uh, the last 20 years of your life? What is your what is your perspective then? if you would. So my perspective is um, for the first um, 20 years, I was a clinician, uh, a specialised musculoskeletal clinician, treating uh, the most severe chronic pain patients. Uh, most of my referring doctors would mo send more difficult patients to me. I wish they'd sent me more easy patients, but they, they tended to give me more difficult patients. And, and as a musculoskeletal physiotherapist, um, I had certain skills to treat them, and most of these people um, that I was interested in had not responded to musculoskeletal treatment. But when I was giving them treatment with uh, PBM as well, um, they were responding. That the reason why I used PBM was that um, Professor Tina Carew came to Australia in 1988 after Chernobyl, which was 1987, and, and was able to tell us why um, the Chernobyl victims with their wounds were um, helped by PBM. 
And so at that time, um, I bought, we bought a laser in the practice and it had very good um, results. It was a space laser. It was very um, weak laser. You had to put it on for a long time. But the combination of the laser and the manual therapy seemed to help these chronic neck pain patients. Um, for a while in those times in our profession, it was reasonably widely used. And then it fell out of favour and not many people were using laser. So I was continuing to use it because it was effective. And then in 2008, I met Dr. Roberta Chow, who just um, completed her PhD in using it for chronic pain in, and especially neck pain, and had done her work at a molecular level and had showed um, the picture, um, which is on the web, on my talk, uh, that was taken and won a, a Science to Art Award for how the laser works on the, the peripheral neurons. So I wanted to know, as a result of that, how it might be helping the brain and the central nervous system and more central pain um, structures that she was also treating. So I decided to do a PhD in headache, looking at the mechanisms of how laser works for unresponsive other uh, treatment. It took me six years. I did it part time while working, and my patients. Um, uh, I, I first of all asked all the manipulative physiotherapists in Australia why people didn't get better, and um, with looking at what they found, I then tested all of those uh, things in my patients over three generations from 93 to five vertically and laterally because I have a family practice um, who had recovered from unresponsive neck pain, and I compared them with their relatives that had never. Are um, that never had neck pain or headache. And I looked to see what was different about them, even though they were um, uh, in remission. And, and, I, and I'll talk about it in my talk, but I found some significant differences between the groups that sort of gave some indications of how the laser might be working. And the corollary of that was um, in very important central pain syndromes like fibromyalgia, and Parkinson's pain, and these pains where the pain is all over the body, I thought um, this was a very important thing to help with those symptoms. And if you are often in less pain, you are less depressed, you have less um, other um, morbidities. So I um, then expanded it into other areas where there are um, headache problems, which is heart disease and particularly Parkinson's. So both migraine, migraineous headache is a um, factor in both, in a risk factor in both of these other diseases. So my research then moved from headache and pain into um, Parkinson's and heart disease. So it's true that you are a physical therapist. Yes. And, uh, it, you know, because I've seen pictures of your clinic, I've seen the people working there, and, I, and I, I'm a chiropractor, so we can't yes. kind of you know, like you, 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 you're like a skyrocket chiropractor, you know, <laughs> physical therapist who becomes a PhD. I sort of was like a, you know, honky tonk chiropractor who got a master's in clinical research 20 years after I graduated. But, you know, the flavor is about the same. You have, the, you know, your sauce is a little bit richer yes. than mine. But the point is, we look at what happens clinically and we yes. say, why, how? I need yes. to have a mechanism because I'm actually yes. doing something. Right. Yes. So would you, would you like to present your slides? Uh, yes, and I think you as a clinician scientist, I think clinicians are scientists. It's just um, we ask the clinically relevant questions and um, try to answer them. But I agree. Yes. So um, you wish me to start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, this, this morning I'd like to be talking about treating Parkinson's disease with photobiomodulation therapy. And I'd like to concentrate on the metabolomic and the microbiome influences on the brain in this treatment. So my name is um, Anne Liebert and um, I had a lovely introduction. Thank you very much, um, Joe. And I'd like to declare uh, the funding for this research was done by Parkinson South Australia, the SAM Foundation at the hospital and anonymous um, angel donors. So the talk will talk a little bit about the research of um, unresponsive pain and headache that led to um, my work on Parkinson's, a little bit about the mechanisms, 
uh, why some people are vulnerable to disease um, and how that might help us with precision medicine and photobiomodulation. A little bit about um, uh, treating the pain of Parkinson's uh, and the pathophysiology. I will mention the importance of the microbiome, but my husband, Dr. Brian Bicknell, will further uh, talk about that in another talk later in the conference. And we'd like to talk about new treatment possibilities in this emerging evidence-based treatment for the attenuation of Parkinson's symptoms, particularly central pain and muscle dysfunction. It, um, it's part of a long history of light therapy in physiotherapists, and I have been a, a physiotherapist working in this field since 1988. And light um, started in the 19th century in medicine um, and in the clinics in Switzerland, but particularly in 1903, um, a doctor in Denmark got the Nobel Prize for, for treating acne vulgaris and smallpox scarring. So since that time, there's been a lot of uh, work in light in areas of medicine, dermatology, uh, and um, Billy Rubin, as well as other aspects of pain starting in 1967. And, and particularly now in these last uh, few decades, it's moved to more intractable diseases, such as uh, myocardial reperfusion injury and um, heart treatment, as well as neurological diseases, depression, multiple sclerosis, and now Parkinson's disease. In our hospital, particularly, uh, 1903, Finston um, talked to Dr. Kellogg, who started the hospital, um, about the treatment and in, in Denmark. And there were um, light beds from 1903. And we now have uh, light beds in our hospital to treat. And we also, um, it's been continuous for light bathing and light treatment in, in the hospital going through the 1970s with Billy Rubin and now particularly to lymphedema, pain and oral mucositis. Uh, in the last four years since I've been at the hospital, we've, we've started to implement um, in oral mucositis and in pre and post operative um, pain and heart surgery, as well as we've just started um, a, a trial in Parkinson's disease. In fact, it's been completed the first stage. So first of all, my interest in PBM started in unresponsive pain and why would photobiomodulation work in the non-responses to manual therapy? So I initially asked all the physiotherapists in Australia why people didn't respond in their opinion to manual therapy because 25% don't respond. They also don't respond to radiofrequency neurotomy or our medication. So I wanted to find out what this cohort was. And um, by, by doing that, I looked intergenerationally um, on my, my patients that had been treated effectively. And I compared them uh, with their relatives that never had headache. And I looked at all the things that the other physiotherapists said were important. And I did this over three years on a Saturday afternoon. And um, uh, right at the end of the treatment, um, I found out there was something that was um, different. So we know light is a switch. It's an allosteric switch for all forms of light. It influences diurnal rhythms within the body. It sets oscillatory patterns in our proteins and organs in chronobiology. And the spectral quality of light modulates the neurotransmitters, including serotonin and dopamine, by the different um, uh, wavelengths. So in the morning, our brain um, modulation is different to the middle of the day. So I wanted to know wh what are we using really when we're using PBM um, to influence the body. So my uh, three-year trial um, ended up, there was one thing that was statistically significant, 2.05 with repeated measures that were different with the people that used to have headache to their relatives that didn't. And as I said, I had patients that were 93 and some were five years old. I had grandparents, cousins, and um, their relatives who were um, very nicely volunteered their time. So um, to summarize, um, I looked at what um, particular things um, that were uh, influenced by balance. So balance, standard balance was different between the two groups. Um, and they were different between eyes open and shut. So despite the patients having a long-term absence of headache due to the completion of treatment, they varied in tandem stance, 
um, with the patients that had no headache. And this feature of tandem balance is called ataxia. It's associated with migraineus vertigo and may indicate a presence of um, pathophys pathophysiology of um, neck headache. A neck headache and migraineous headache share characteristics. A migraineous headache often and ataxia is often a potassium or a calcium iron channel um, dysfunction genetically. So my hypothesis was that cervicogenic headache, um, which is what I was treating, which is um, hemiplegic, may be a mild channelopathy of a potassium channel. So uh, there was a research-based argument that the treatment of unresponsive cervicogenic headache was based on the proteomic changes epigenetically of other potassium channels and other proteins. And that was my um, hypothesis, and that was formed the basis of the conclusion of my PhD. And most interestingly, I have been doing laser since 1988 because of Professor Tina Carew, and Professor Tina Carew's work in the 1990s said that one of the main mechanisms of laser was treating potassium channels. So it, it was um, very uh, good um, um, symmetry. Synergy. Synergy. So uh, I went on from that to look at further proteins that would influence those um, uh, proteins at the membrane uh, and the ion channels. And I looked at how they are influenced and I looked at intrinsically disordered proteins. So these are proteins that don't have an actual form and when other proteins attach onto them or they have post-translational modification, they change their form and function. And I found that photobiomodulation affects many of these intrinsically disordered proteins and can have um, a change in the uh, proteomics and therefore epigenetics. And these, there are global um, network of um, proteins. You can have global methylation in chronic pain. And I, I looked at something which is called global simulation, which changes all of these different um, proteins where little um, molecules of sumo attach on and, and change it like um, methylation. So I looked at these theories and, and I looked at all the literature and I um, looked at how prion protein, which is a very important protein to assemble these proteins, was influenced and how this perhaps was um, uh, one of the mechanisms of, of liaison. So I um, published this work. Um, and very Excuse me, that, the IDP is the, could you go back one please? It's the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, intrinsic disordered protein. Yes, intrinsically disordered proteins. Got it. Or they can be proteins with an intrinsically disordered part of them. So they're able to change. And so if you think about uh, a protein like insulin, uh, it has a, a good um, um, stage and it has a, a, a not good stage. And so intrinsically disordered changes in these proteins change their function and, and then therefore change the network of proteomic um, metabolic uh, transmission because the proteins have a different change. Um, things like macrophage coming from M1 to M2 is another example of a protein changes after intrinsically disordered areas are changed. Perfect. So I published these two uh, papers. Um, as integrative treatment and formed the basis of my PhD. And then I looked at how this might be in um, the central nervous system in memories. And we have a picture on the right of a cortical memory and it's produced by protein changes on the um, post synaptic density to form those little bumps. And if you stop the protein synthesis, which happens with protein aging in old age and Alzheimer's, your memory disappears. Now, this is um, interestingly what happens with migraine headache. You have a temporary loss of memory or temporary loss of sight, temporary loss of function, and your proteins assemble and disassemble temporarily, and they come back to normal. But also happens if you hibernate, you disassemble all your proteins, and then when it warms, if you're a squirrel, um, they sort of come back together when you have enough uh, energy food to, to supply the, the protein synthesis. But the ground-dwelling squirrel that hibernates has a much worse memory to um, their relatives than one that doesn't. So it has got an impact of changing our um, protein structures. Can I just look at that for a minute? I just want to look at that for a minute. That is a 
picture of a memory. A, a, a memory in a mouse. In it's a, a mouse. cortical memory, and they stopped all of the protein synthesis by adding an acid uh, base to it, and um, the, the, pro, the memory disappeared. Uh, I, I'm just fascinated. Keep going. Love it. So I was looking at um, temporary changes uh, in function, and then um, migraine changes and then permanent loss of memory. So I think if you can reverse it, why don't we understand it so that we can maybe help in uh, long-term brain problems? So just, to, just to, to bring that full circle, the protein conform conformational modulation by photons, a mechanism for laser treatment effects. And this was yes. the paper that won you the Global Medical Discovery Every Award. Yes. It's, it's important to take, to take a moment and just take this all in, that the prion protein signaling in the nervous system uh, is what well, you did a full review of this and then went further and talked about mechanisms of interaction with photons of light, correct? Yes, Love. yes. So I just integrated it across many levels of biophysics, biochemistry, molecular chemistry, um, and, and then systems biology. Beautiful. So then I looked at um, these particular intrinsically disordered proteins and how they are affected in patterns of vulnerability to disease and how we might target very specifically um, certain conditions and perhaps within people we might need to use different wavelengths because I think it's a code. So I, I extended that to heart and chronic pain including fibromyalgia and post-operative cognitive dysfunction, which is often associated with loss of memory, loss of cognition, and a lot of post-operative pain, and how they interact. And then from that, I, um, uh, in my position at Sydney University, uh, we, we did some brainstorming, and um, we decided to um, start to, to do Parkinson's disease. So I've been working with Sydney University, Professor John Mitrofanis and Professor Jonathan Stone, um, side by side since 2010 but in 2016 we decided to join forces uh, from in the medical faculty to do some work on Parkinson's disease and cardiac disease. So more recently uh, from 2017 because my husband Dr Brian Bicknell was also part of my research group we were brainstorming and he thought that the abscopal effect that I was describing in my paper um, that um, had been based on Yui Oren's work where you use the um, laser on the tibia has a better effect on the heart scar than um, on the um, when you use it over the heart so it was 67 percent over the tibia compared to 47 percent in the heart and that had also predicated some of the helmet experiments that John Mitrofanis and Professor Stone have been uh, performing at Sydney University in conjunction with a lab in France so we were both looking at why would treatment distal to the problem be important? And then Brian um, said, I think treating the abdomen has something to do with the microbiome. And he will talk about um, from that. So that was in um, November 2017. And that's looked at some, some new mechanisms that, um, that have turned out to, to seem to be important. So all of these are research. Uh, has looked at the possibility for emerging evidence-based treatment for the attenuation of Parkinson's symptoms, including central pain and muscle dysfunction. So the patterns of vulnerability, we've already talked about channelopathies, um, and that can include epilepsy, erythromyalgia, benign ataxia, migraine, migraine with aura. There are other um, mechanisms um, in terms of mitochondrial genetic um, mutations from the mitochondrial gene and um, some more in terms of the malaportin signaling system and the microbiome. So I've been alerted to the fact that it's not only our DNA, our mitochondrial DNA, it's our microbiome um, has more DNA at least by 10 times and the whole of our DNA forms the holobiome and that's what we're influencing when we're influencing health and disease. So the idiopathic pain disorders, uh, chronic pain, um, fibromyalgia, um, different sorts of depression, um, chronic regional pain disorder, you would argue Parkinson's, idiopathic Parkinson's, which has a lot of pain, um, have a lot of um, genetic 
vulnerabilities for that. They um, are in the receptors, the cannabinoid receptors in the serotonin um, area. And um, these patterns of um, vulnerability have been increasingly looked at. And we need to target these people if they have an injury to have slightly different treatments so they don't go on to a chronic pain condition. And one particular one of most note that I looked at is the melacortin signaling um, receptor, and that causes you to be redheaded. So this has a large effect on risk factors for Parkinson's and heart, and it gives you much more chance of dysfunction in your arteries and stiffness in both mice and humans. But most interestingly, my colleague, Professor Lisa Laxo at um, Queensland University in 1996 showed that photobiomodulation in forms of laser affected the POMC pathway, which is um, shared with the melacortin receptor um, pathway, and it influences um, ACTH beta opioid, and it was the way that it helped um, uh, some chronic pain that she was treating. So she um, identified this back in 1996 as part of her PhD. So this POMC molecule also has um, involved with um, the melanocortin pain syn syndrome and all of the sex hormones, alpha MSH, which are anti-inflammatory, the cortisol hormones. It also has something to do with melanogenesis. So it, this links the melanocortin signaling system with um, pain and cardiovascular system. And this is what I was most interested in. As also part of my PhD, I did some transmission studies into melanin and I found out there was neuromelanin in the brain and melanin was in all of the nervous system. So I was very interested in, in the embryology of um, POMC. So um, redheadedness is associated with inflammatory arthritis. Are more likely to have inflammatory autoimmune conditions, Parkinson's disease, cardiac diseases, particularly um, tannelopathies like atrial fibrillation. So the melacortin signaling system responds to light, and this is what was in common with everything. And so I looked at it in within the heart system and cardiac reperfusion. I did some case studies with that, and um, we have a, a trial that's um, been completed in Tasmania. And I looked at the same mechanism in neural blockade in the anaesthetic. So that's where we um, looked at the post-operative cognitive dis dysfunction. And these were coming back all the time to these ion channels that are involved with migraine and neck headache. So if we look at um, the photographs on the right, this was replication of Roberta Charles' work in a pain model in um, Winita Anders' group, and it shows um, the pain model is blocked by the varicosities and temporary neural blockade um, in chronic pain. But if you look at those varicosities, it's exactly the same as the temporary um, central brain uh, changes in varicosities in migraine. And this is also common um, after uh, trauma, we get a traumatic change in varicosities, which is neuroprotective. In fact, if you stop that varicosity after a head injury, um, many more uh, neurons will die. So not only was it in the periphery, it was then in the central nervous system. This change that we're having to the membrane. And then we looked at um, why this was in, in, in the inflammasome, um, in the lymphatics. And interestingly, if you give um, mice with Parkinson's, a neck injury where you're blocking um, their neck and giving them a neck problem, all of their motor symptoms increase. Mm. So how does migraine pain photosensitivity, because migraine and aura, you, you have photosensitivity, influence um, Parkinson's? And that's where my research for the last three and a half years has been. And we've looked at the migraine dopamine link and um, how does dopamine affect chronic pain, um, oscillation patterns in the brain, performance, um, and migraine? Um, it is a very uh, strong link. Um, and interestingly, the microbiome makes dopamine. So this is where we intersect, we think. 
interestingly, if you have a migraine, you have a very much different nitrate and nitric acid reducing oral microbes in your um, mouth. You have completely different microbiome. So this may be um, leading us to something that's in important. So in the symptoms of chronic pain, uh, motor symptoms of normal function and in, in Parkinson's disease, photobiomodulation and many of the talks um, in this conference is, is explaining this, um, have demonstrated to change the gamma oscillations and also change the theta oscillations that appear to be part of the pathophysiology of both Parkinson's disease and chronic pain. And Professor John Mitrofanis' group um, put PBM on um, Biolight on the head and showed that you could improve finger tapping performance in a normal model. And there are lots of uh, wonderful experiments uh, that are going on around the world in this space. So what is pain is often one of the first um, symptoms of Parkinson's disease or constipation or lack of sleep. Um, it can be frozen shoulder, it can be diagnosed as pseudoarthritic, uh, and it is definitely to be um, part of the pathophysiology is the loss of gamma oscillation in the brain, and it's a challenge in Parkinson's disease. So if we could uh, maybe identify this and treat it earlier, perhaps this would be the best thing that we can do in Parkinson's disease to help the, the physical pain and the muscle pain. So pain um, is associated uh, with Parkinson's disease. We had looked at um, where we would apply the treatment to it. Um, there's been a, a lot of uh, work in terms of our um, colleagues at Sydney University in, in France doing intracranial photobiomodulation, transcranial photobiomodulation, and then um, uh, we have also been now using remote after uh, the work in Israel on heart. So they were using, uh, since 2010, uh, laser on the abdomen and the buttocks of mice and getting also good results. So this is called the um, abscopal or systemic effect. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we think this could happen, but particularly in mitochondrial signaling. And now we know that the mitochondria are free in the blood, not just in the cells. So Parkinson's pain is often the first symptom. Um, it's associated with muscle tightness or dystonia. It can be pseudoarthritic and it can include all the symptoms of fibromyalgia, which is also another thing that um, photobiomodulation is very good at treating. So the default note network um, is dysregulated in chronic pain and in Parkinson's and the link seems to be dopamine to decrease the connectivity. And we're knowing a lot more about the functional connectome within the brain and the protein networks and the default networks and the attention networks and how this may be dysregulated when we have pathology. So in precision medicine, we need to have an individualised approach. We may um, know that not all people have these sensitivities towards um, chronic pain, and we might be able to target better once we know the mechanism, who would benefit from our treatment and what specific treatment we might like to give them. So we've doing, as I said, in the heart, there's a, a large trial going down on in, in Tasmania using this prior to stenting, and, and they've already done 120 patients, um, and um, I reviewed all the mechanisms. So in terms of Parkinson's and the microbiome, um, there's increasing evidence that it actually can start in the gut 10 years before um, you have symptoms in the brain. And it, uh, how this relationship happens uh, and uh, is being very uh, well elucidated, particularly in the Parkinson's disease that's caused by exposure to chemicals. And it seems to be important as the um, gut microbiota is healthy, there seems to be um, a correlation between the progression of symptoms. So how this might influence where we treat the area and our um, uh, treatment regimes is um, what we've been looking at both in an animal model and in a, um, now in our human trials. 
And interestingly, antibiotics are now connected with risk of Parkinson's disease. And this is in a 10 to 20 year program. So does it start in the gut? Can we maybe target the gut? And it seems to be some evidence that we should be doing this. The most convincing evidence is previously before they knew that ulcers were um, caused by Heliobacter. They used to do a vagus nerve um, vagotomy to decrease ulcers. And they showed there was a subsequent decreased risk in Parkinson's disease. So we know it's important. So is it a therapeutic target? So we um, had done these experiments in mice. They were so profoundly important and are published that we um, have said, if this exists for um, humans, this might be a very important um, treatment option. I've been working with Professor Kayat, who's the cardiologist who has um, worked with all our work in, in the heart, and he feels that this might be important in other diseases. Um, the, apart from um, pain and Parkinson's. Uh, and this is something we may do later. So we started um, with a clinical trial in Adelaide. This was because um, John Mitrofanis's group were um, applying this in um, treatment um, directly to patients from their, their work. And from that work, um, that was on our um, ABC television, the people, Parkinson South Australia, uh, said, could we do this um, as, a, as, a, as a trial? So I just I'd like to play uh, this. A do-it-yourself approach to treating Parkinson's disease in Tasmania has led to a university clinical trial in Australia. It began with the group of Tasmanians who were living with Parkinson's discovering that putting red light helmets on their head twice a day was halting the progression of their symptoms and improving their quality of life. They've inspired the clinical trial that's now underway across Australia to find out if the lights are actually making a difference or if it's just the placebo effect at work. At a home in Tasmania's northeast, a retired specialist doctor and an electronics expert are developing infrared light helmets, devices they say are improving lives. While many people claim these red light helmets are helping their brain, many health professionals remain sceptical as it's yet to be scientifically proven if they're making a long-term difference. But a team of researchers in Sydney are hoping to change that. Dr. Anne Liebert and her team are running a clinical trial involving Parkinson's and non-Parkinson's patients in Sydney, Brisbane and South Australia. They hope to show that the reported improvements aren't the result of a placebo effect and the normal waxing and waning of Parkinson's. The main uh, hope is that we can capture and replicate what the clinical observations have been over the last few years in Tasmania, in other centres around Australia, and that we can characterise and predict who would be able to uh, benefit from the helmets if it's a sustained improvement. The first results of the trial are expected later this year. I think that it will open up much broader uh, opportunities or possibilities for the medical profession that haven't yet been discovered. So this led to our Parkinson's trial in Adelaide first. Um, we had 12 participants. It was cross over design. So people were having the treatment and then they crossed over. Um, and we had to modify that and I'll get that to later. We had assessment by neurologist. We had intertherapist reliability. They had 12 treatments over an eight week period. They had treatment to their head, intranasal, laser to the abdomen and laser to the neck. Um, and they were um, reassessed at the conclusion. Um, group A was six. They had the treatment for 12 weeks and then we at four weeks we tied titrated the dose down and we retested it. We had a washout period. Um, and then uh, we in, continued with the helmet um, treatment after 12 weeks. This was because uh, one of the patients had improved so much, the, the actual neurologist said you were not allowed to stop the treatment because you may um, uh, not get that same result. So we ended up having just a waiting room design. 
The group B had to wait for uh, 12 weeks first and then had the same uh, treatment. Uh, and then they were retested at four weeks because we, we got a great uh, change in the first people at four weeks where we didn't test them to 12 weeks. So we changed the testing through ethics. Uh, the trial in Sydney had seven participants um, they had only remote and abdominal treatment uh, and no transcranial. They'd had 12 weeks, we've now finished that, and they uh, also had to exercise. We had many common outcome measures. We had musculoskeletal flexibility, up and go, balance, walk test, tremor test, nine hole peak test, cognition test, sleep test, care diary test, mood test. But we also had three novel markers. We had a tryptican kinerin ratio, vitamin B3, which is niacin, and we tested the microbiome uh, at um, three points through the trial. We had preliminary results from uh, Adelaide last year, and we have now 12 um, month results. And the very pleasing thing was you can take any amount of Parkinson's uh, dopamine drugs and you there's no evidence that you will we gain your sense of smell, which is a major symptom in Parkinson's. And at least three of our people in um, Adelaide and equivalently in Sydney regained some of their sense of smell, which was, was wonderful. So the, the results, uh, we've been uh, spending the last three months looking at them. Um, not everybody improved and they didn't all improve immediately. No one got worse overall, even after a year. However, some symptoms did not improve. It was highly individual. There seemed to be some super responders. And when we did the statistics, 11 out of 19 appeared to be in that category. There were some responders and some that were slow responders. And they often didn't recognize any response, but their partner did. So that's why the partner um, diary was good. And, and it was only often apparent on reflection at the end of the trial um, that there was an improvement. So uh, we did microbiome analysis um, on um, initially on um, after four days, after four weeks and at the end, and then we have done them after uh, 12 months. We also saw an improvement called the Hawthorne effect just being on the trial. That was um, uh, also there. There were no adverse effects, which confirms all our many publications of photobiomodulation on safety. Uh, there were complications. People had to have antibiotics and have cancer therapy and infections at the time, so there were confounders. Um, and when we titrated the treatment down from three times a week to once a week in Adelaide, um, we found a, a definite treatment effect. So we changed that then in Sydney. So the preliminary results, uh, we had motor and non-motor um, improvement. We had sense of smell. We had uh, pain was um, expected because uh, photobiomodulation helps pain. And this is central pain because the pain moves around. Um, and it was generally improved, particularly constipation and diarrhea. Speech, there was improvement in loudness of the voice, sleep, general mood, um, fine motor tasks. Um, Professor Mitrofanis is doing all about micrography. It's one of the things that happens in Parkinson's. But most importantly, uh, and that we're most uh, pleased with, in cognition in Adelaide, 10 out of 10 improved. Um, this is in the Mocha test, and it was sustained for over one year, which is not a Hawthorne or a placebo effect. We did look at minimally clinically important differences, uh, which is a half a um, standard deviation of baseline um, as well um, in our analysis. Uh, so we, we um, uh, also then combine the studies uh, to get um, T-tests. So a few graphs. Um, this is the Adelaide walking speed. Group A didn't have to wait for the treatment. They improved um, with the um, 12 weeks. Then they um, sustained the improvement mostly uh, over um, 24 weeks and then over one year. Adelaide group um, also improved a little bit while they were waiting for the trial, and that's the Hawthorne effect. Um, but six, um, the minimally important difference, four out of six improved over, over the um, 12 months. And nine out of 10 after one year. Sydney's walking speed, also um, we didn't titrate the toast down and we're at, only at 12 weeks already from there, finished before Christmas also improved, three out of seven at four weeks, um, two out of seven at 12 weeks. 
This, remember, is only treating the abdomen and neck and not the head. So the spiral test uh, was also improved in Adelaide and the Sydney spiral test. So, so in looking at it, uh, we actually think that we have to treat more than one area to get the maximum effect, but we are getting improvements in both. And this is the one that really reflects. So 10 out of 10 had improved their cognition over a year. And the Mocha test is out of 30. Often they were 26. And um, four out of six at four weeks, six out of 12 at um, 12 weeks, but 10 out of 10 at one year. So there was further improvement. And these people had home treatment for that year. What did you find, Anne? What did you find was the, uh, the Mocha the mean minimal clinically important difference uh, with the MOCA. Did you get that? Here, this, the, the Hawthorne, you said uh, we have a, a Hawthorne was three of six, but to, yes. to see these changes from like in the mid twenties uh, to normalization in almost all of them. Yes. Uh, you saw a, you know, that that was the, that's an important number the minimum. So it's probably like about a two, right? Yes, it would be about a two. Would you? Yes. Um, yeah, I'd have to have a look at that. But there, there is a Hawthorne effect. Being, being on the trial, particularly in Parkinson's, the placebo effect is quite strong. Um, but we would expect no placebo or Hawthorne effect at that one year. Correct. So Adelaide, uh, the Group B mocker, and the Sydney mocker also improved five out of seven at 12 weeks. And these people, although they only had an abdomen and neck treatment, they um, had it three times a week for 12 weeks. And we, they will also be followed up um, later as well. We had the step test uh, was uh, very um, uh, improved uh, and sustained the improvement. Uh, group B sustained the improvement, but the, the differences were different between people. Um, and that's the Sydney affected leg. So in summary, the symptoms vary with the participants, but there was a response in all participants. The, the things we saw most was cognition, gross motor and fine motor. And when we put the two trials together, so either before and after PBM, two different ways, it was significant to pair T-tests. So we know what sort of power we have if, if we have a large RCT. Uh, the improvements maintained for up to one year. Uh, it, there's the, all the measures we used were sensitive enough to see the Hawthorne effect and the titrated dose effect. So when we decreased the people in Adelaide, they were not as good. Uh, so we feel um, with looking at all the evidence and Brian will um, give you all of the um, data regarding the microbiome, we think that transcranium plus abdominal gave better improvement than just abdominal. But um, the tryptophan kinerin ratio, which is an indication of energy available um, towards the electron transport chain and the CERT um, pathways, improved for eight out of nine of the participants in Sydney. We only did it in Sydney. And the vitamin B3, which is a precursor to NAD, also improved with four out of the six people. So we're looking at these as potential markers for Parkinson's, of which presently there are none. So I'd like to just uh, show uh, one of our participants. Um, this is at four weeks after um, juggling. He used to be able to juggle 20 years before and decided to try and do it again. The first video is immediately before the treatment at four weeks and then immediately after the treatment, which I think might show coherence. And the other one is at the conclusion of the trial. Right after the treatment, you can see the form as a, as a physiotherapist and health practitioner. And this is at the end. You can then do 38 uh, throws um, uh, at the end of it. This is a Parkinson patient. Yes, Parkinson's patient. Uh, that's one after brave. 12 weeks of treatment with PBM. That's a brave man right there. Four, how many weeks? Four weeks? 12. Well, we the, first, the first one were four weeks afterwards. He couldn't throw a ball at the beginning. Wow.
So um, this next video is also one of our participants from Adelaide. This is after her first treatment. We, we wanted people to do something that they wanted to improve and she particularly wanted to improve walking um, uh, in the supermarket uh, because all her bags would crash against her um, thigh and she thought it didn't look uh, very good. So this is her immediately before the first treatment. And this is immediately afterwards, she went out on the side and did a bit of practice and came back in, which we weren't expecting. So, so that's an immediate coherence thing. And our next trial, we have permission and ethics to do MRI. So I'd just like to acknowledge husband Brian Bicknell, Sharon Tilly, um, the other physiotherapists that work with me, Professor Lisa Laxo, Roberta Chow, Hosen Kayat, and um, John Mitrofanis, Jonathan So, Daniel Johnson um, from Sydney University, and my PhD supervisor, Dr. Roger Adams, who just told me to persist. And I also I acknowledge that I'm a founder and director of Simbex, and our mission is to, to make some um, appliances to help with, with layers. Thanks. Sorry, not, I'm not hearing. Can't hear. Sorry. Sorry about that. So I just have a couple. Sorry, that was my fault. I have a couple questions that, and I wanted to say that we covered a lot of bases here, uh, as <laughs> usual. We went around the horn, uh, uh, but I wanted to say that I, I'm, I'm following you because my original research was in uh, vertiginous migraine. Ah, really? That's amazing. And I did it. I looked at the pain thresholds with vertiginous migraines and saw how they changed. And also yes. did a lot of work with movement disorders. And the, the central pain aspect was great that you touched on that. So, you, so just a couple things. The red hair, because that was hard to understand that word. The red hair meant you had this melatox, melatis, melatocin? What'd you call it? Um, so, so the red hair is a melacortin um, receptor difference. And so um, uh, that means that <coughs> all the um, molecular pathways within POMC are not the same if you're redheaded or not, because your receptor is not the same. So you're more likely to get an immune um, uh, response, you're more likely to get melanoma. Melanoma is very much associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, your coherence is different. Um, you um, have quite a different personality because your goal-directed behaviour is determined by your melanin cortin signalling system and your um, alpha MSH. And so that's why red-headed people um, are different. You know, it's a funny thing that these, uh, the substantia nigra is made of melanin, correct? That's what yes. makes it black. So That's right, and that's what fades in Parkinson's. And so that's something that you kind of was, did that, was that, so you snipped around that a little bit? Is that how yes, you yes. made that connection? Absolutely, and, and all of my research is also on neuromelanin because I did transmission studies as part of my um, PhD as well, so with black people with Somalian skin to white skin and I looked at transmission and in the part of that I found out there was neuromelanin in the brain. So when we had that brainstorming session with Brian, I actually thought it was the neuromelanin that's in the gut, it's also in the heart um, and it is extremely important um, a, a, for, as a semiconductor and it does fade um, in Parkinson's and neuromelanin in the brain is formed by the breakdown of dopamine metabolites. And so if you're not producing any dopamine, you're not producing any neuromelanin. And if the neuromelanin breaks down and goes into um, the plasma, it seems to cause inflammation and further aggravate the um, Parkinson's. So it is absolutely crucial about the melacortin signaling system. But anything in that POMC system responds to light. And embryologically, that's why. And I didn't talk about any of my other theories here. They were too... Uh, difficult. We're trying to stick to Parkinson's, but it's an, it's about um, light from within as well. Light from within. Biophotons. Biophoton. Light from within. Yes. So if you've got a normal um, um, cell uh, compared to a cancer cell, it has a different signature of photons. Very good. Oh, I might touch on that. I might I might give you a push one more time to hear a little bit more about that. That's fine. But 
So what I'm saying is that if uh, 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 the dopamine of the, the serotonin is made in the gut, but the serotonin in the gut is not the same, is not utilized by the brain. It's a different serotonin. Am I correct? Uh, no, it's a um, metabolite equivalent. So yes, um, it can be utilized in the peripheral system and serotonin is important throughout the whole body. Dopamine in the gut can be utilized within um, the system as well. So yes, and alpha MSH is also manufactured by microbiome in the gut. So all of these um, chemicals are manufactured in the gut and they can be transported to, through neurotrophic signaling um, up into the spinal cord. That's right. At least, uh, and now, so that's the whole thing. I was postulating that at least the serotonin of the gut can interact neurotropically with the vagus yes. nerve and tell, yes. and at least give the signal that, hey, everything's cool here. Yes, yes. And so maybe it's not something like that. But I'm surprised now about the vagotomy. Cutting the vagus nerve reduces your incidence of Parkinson's. Almost Why? completely, yes. Why? Because the vagus nerve, we postulate that at least the metabolites um, uh, within the gut um, are transported by the vesicles into the brain. So they've done this now um, in mouse experiments and they've shown that if they dysregulate the gut and give them MPTP, then what happens is those metabolites move by the vagus nerve to go into the olfactory bulb and then out. So that's why in Parkinson's cognitive frontal cortex is the last. It's a brainstem. Everything that's associated with the vagus nerve goes first, olfactory bulb, then spreads to the next part. So, so that's why not all um, Parkinson's starts in the gut. It can start um, in the um, um, nose and, and other areas or it can be genetic. And, and what's most interesting in our results is that perhaps the people that had the strongest genetic component of Parkinson's where siblings had passed away already, perhaps were not the responders. So you have a holobiome where you have your, your DNA, your mitochondrial DNA and your microbial DNA. Now, um, if your um, host genetics are so strong, maybe we can't compensate with your microbial genetics. And what we found clinically as well as in our experiments, if you titrate the dose down, the host genetics take over. So we're basically compensating with your holobiome, we think. But that may not be enough if it's very strong genetics. I like it. So when, when we talk a little bit about the black box, yes. you've sort yes. of kind of opened up a couple yes. of boxes, like a box inside of a box inside of a box, which is very helpful because, you know, when you're looking at chronic pain, Anne, you know, you're actually studying the emotional aspects of the brain. And the, the point is, with being a physical therapist, you are, we, you know, we work on the physical aspects of the brain. So yes. when you start to understand chronic pain, you say, oh, this is this brain thing, this is an emotion thing, this is a thing. But then you kept going and opening it up and opening it up and opening it up and say, now it's the, it's the, uh, exudate of all the bacterial material that is us, all the cellular material is us, correct? Yes. All right, so. And, and we find with chronic pain, if you treat chronic, you treat the actual source of it, where it spreads through the mitochondrial signaling, then often the depression and the uh, mood and everything goes away if you take the pain away. So then flip it back around and tell me if I'm overstepping here, Brian's gonna, gonna <laughs> elucidate me. Yeah, but but so then but I put the light on the body, I'm influencing all of those features also. The light is penetrating through all those boxes, correct? That's right. But remember the redox state of the receptor determines whether it does anything. So you've got to put it on where it starts. And, and it might be several things that are mucking up the system. If you don't treat each specifically with precision medicine, you do not get the overall effect. So you need to put it on where you actually um, are going to get bang for the buck because it, it has most effect when it's most under stress. Now, and, I, and I say there's a difference between the treatment and treating to an outcome, which people don't usually shoot for. And that's more precision is what you're talking about. Exactly. So my, uh, 
the, the funny thing is my uh, case report used multimodal uh, photobiomodulation, intranasal, transcranial helmet, and a body pad that we put wherever we wanted, the belly, the back, the shoulders, mm -hmm. everywhere like that. Uh, and we also showed the improvement in smell. So yes. What the first ones. What are you, what were you using for the smell test down there? Uh, we use this American validated smell test, what's it called? Um, but unfortunately, uh, it has 20 or 30 things, including skunk, and we don't have skunk in Australia. So um, the, the first ones uh, we didn't test, but because they regain their sense of smell, they could smell the flowers, they smell the diesel, the, everything. We then did the smell test, um, and two out of um, six got um, improved objectively, um, and, and one or two more. How many? Um, like that. Yes, smell identification test. Um, it's smell. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Oh, yes. So that's a spin. The sniff test. Smell sniff test. So that's what we did. Yes. And we only did it because we got the outcomes from Adelaide. We were quite surprised. We didn't ask. They just said we can smell everything. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, uh, did we cover everything that you wanted to cover? Did we touch on it? I think so. I, I hope it wasn't too much. It's just that well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's very I interesting that you also did migraine as vertical headache because it's it's so important, you know. So while I have you here, and I know you don't have the slide for it, so make bunny pictures with your fingers. Explain to me if you would, because you you talked a lot about the light affecting the photons affecting calcium channels and things like that the channel yes. and yes. things like that and you kind of glazed over we didn't hear too much about the mitochondria so could you kind of give me your your perspective on the light to the or you could say no uh, <laughs> the light and the and how it affects the uh, these channels these these channelopathies um, well, I, th I think the light uh, is absorbed by all the superficial nerves um, at a point where you directly absorb by the membrane. And so they're, they're absorbed by the TRPV1 channels, um, a lot of the opsins that are on the, the membrane, and then they have a direct effect on potassium channels. And it also, um, Tina Cruz show you directly modulate the potassium channels. Now that's on, on where you're actually reaching the light. Now we have, as you know, with some with, um, infrared lasers, the penetration is quite deep. We're aiming for the dorsal root ganglion um, and we're getting some photons within that area. But what I think is that we get a response at the membrane and then we get um, a directional response into the mitochondria and then into the nucleus from the membrane. That's my thoughts. It's downstream. Um, it definitely has an effect on, on mitochondrial function. Um, but it, whether it's absorbed directly by the cytochrome C oxidase or there is a transmission from the membrane downstream um, in uh, mitochondrial signaling, um, retrograde and antegrade, that is my thought. Um, I think that the signaling from the mitochondria then goes directly into the nucleus via phototransduction um, within or mechanotransduction. Um, there's very good evidence for that. So I think it's um, downstream. I think there are mitochondrial effects, but also because it works on red blood cells to change the conformation of the membrane, there's no mitochondria in a red blood cell. And so there are other effects directly, but we also produce ATP at the membrane for other processes, which I think we also augment. So there's more than one way to get ATP. Thank you, dear. Thank you for that. I wanted to touch on the blood because we know we're using the terms direct effect and indirect effect. Yes. And yes. so the direct effect happens to be many times what the scientist is looking at. So yes. you, know, you want to look at the mouse nuclei. That's what you're looking at. What is the direct effect there? <laughs> The indirect is all the other tissue that's being touched by the light. Uh, and so, you know, you're the first one to speak about the superficial nerves being attached yes. and, and these sort of things. And, and, you know, that's kind of what I played with. It's like, uh, you know, superficial nerves were the ones that were dead in peripheral neuropathy. And we were able to grow, show that those nerves come back. Sensation comes back, hot, cold, balance, all that stuff. 
would return. And I'm like, well, we must be growing the nerves back. No, you can't do that. Nerves don't grow back. I'm like, well, what, what are we doing? We're putting the light two centimeters in, three centimeters in, and the nerves are growing back. So, it, you know, nerve regeneration or no regeneration that's with it. light is a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. It, it, that's right. And, 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 uh, and uh, um, Dr. Mester from 1967 said it was the bystander effect. Everything was a systemic effect, even in wound healing. It was still systemic. It wasn't direct. And I think he was the first person that showed it. It was biphasic and it was systemic and bystander. So the bystander effect is you do something here, you have an effect um, adjacent. And the abscopal effect, which is what I am talking about, is the distal bystander effect. But I think the most exciting thing in the last three months is that they've shown that mitochondria are exosomes outside of the cell and they're in the bloodstream and they can then spread something called prototoxic stress. So if you have an RSI problem, a swelling in your hand and it comes into your elbow, it goes to the other side and sometimes it goes down the leg. So the, the stress is spread. So if you've got toxic, um, prototoxic um, mitochondria and they're now out of the um, cell and they're in the bloodstream and they're spreading, perhaps they can be in endosome into the other mitochondria and spread the, um, the signal. That's what I think is quite exciting, but very interesting, Professor John Mitrofanis, and I hope you asked this um, last week, has shown with um, Professor Jeffrey that mitochondria have a circadian rhythm. And that's why most of the um, Olympics are always in the afternoon um, after two o'clock. So mitochondria influenced by light in a circadian rhythm. The microbiome has a separate circadian rhythm. Every organ's got a circadian rhythm. So we've got a complex system here that we're tapping into that I think it makes a difference. And we've certainly found a difference in our Parkinson's patients if we treat them um, in the trial in the morning or the afternoon. So we had to regulate it, um, that it had to be the same time every day. Otherwise, we're not comparing apples with apples uh, that you know the timing is another thing the color is another thing it, it gets more complicated but luckily we have brains like yours to think of <laughs> thank you thank you now, but interesting with your migraine people they respond to different colors of light differently <laughs> green safe <laughs> green is safe, well, well, green is safe. <laughs> so um, you've given us a, an overview of the last 20 years of your life in this research maybe more Turn, it, yes. turn, your, turn your lens around and tell me what you see looking at over the horizon to the future. We're doing the 2030 brain, and you and I both, luckily, yes. we're healthy and well, and our brains are working well. So I'm doing the 2030 brain and transcranial photobiomodulation virtual summit. Uh, yes. What are we going to be talking about? I think we're going to talk, be talking about Precision medicine, we're going to look at genetics, epigenetics and proteomics and we're going to be able to work out a particular dose for a person um, that will keep them well. I think they'll have their own um, uh, light source at home, whatever that may be, that's particular to them and we'll be able to give them a prescription um, as a, as a um, something like good nutrition or good medical management that can keep them well um, uh, with a uh, evidence-based, science-based approach. And I think that all the direction now will be on precision um, and particularly in vulnerable places. Like you, if you live in the north of Norway, you're much more likely to get MS. You're much more likely to get Parkinson's depending on what month you're born. So we will be able to maybe look at algorithms that might be able to mitigate what is, and there might be some challenges going forward in, um, in 2030 that might mean that we might need this even more than we did before. You know, when people, when we talk about precision and everything like that, do you find that uh, people be able to, you know, pull up their phone and tap in the mood that they want yeah. or the, that I want more appetite or I feel I need more energy or do you think it's going to be that it's got to be doctor driven or do you think that these things can be also patient driven? I think they'll be patient driven, but I think also they'll be doctor driven because I, I think that as we know, um, more is not necessarily better. 
Um, I don't think there's any um, adverse things with photobiomodulation, but I think um, understanding at a cellular level and at an illness level and at a psychological level how best to apply treatment is going to require some intervention. I think the sociology of medicine says even if we have all that information and algorithm on a watch doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the best way that we treat ourselves. I think there'll always be room for um, other people um, intervening. <laughs> <laughs> At least the, a swift kick in the butt every once in a while. Appointment. That's, the one. That's exactly right. You do your exercises, thank you, in the chiropractic way. <laughs> I want to, Anne, uh, I want to thank you for your time and your effort. You're welcome. And all the work that you've done in this field. It was my distinct pleasure to have this interview. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. That's great. Thank you.